So we'll get started at the beginning of our interface. Here is what you typically see when you log on to 3D Experience native apps. Native apps, uh, when I'm referring to it, is just your local install of the platform. Uh, within 3D Experience, you have access to uh, what's called web apps and what's called native apps. The web apps are simply, uh, they're, they're directed more towards your Anovia and PLM and kind of business uh, workflows and actions. Whereas your native apps, your locally installed platform, is going to be more directed towards your authoring apps or your and your design engineering so your part design generative shape design etc your typical cad tools if you will so here in our interface we have the option to go and search our data right from here the data is stored within 3d experience uh depending on um depending on what type of platform you have you can give me just a moment here i just need to uh Go, just logging back in. So yeah, depending on what type of platform you have, uh, all your data is stored within 3D Experience, but depending on um, what type of server you go with, uh, that'll dictate where specifically your data is stored. So you can still store it all kind of in-house, if you will. So let's imagine we're going in and we want to open a front fork assembly for a motorcycle. And when we go and search, we have some options of how we want to open. So we can choose to either open our data, which will open our full design data, or we could choose to explore. So what explore does is it gives you a couple options depending on what type of data you're working with. Uh, so we're working with a general just assembly. So we're just going to use product finder. That's kind of the, the default one for assemblies. And what this does is it opens up your data in a lightweight format. So if you're familiar with Katia V5, this is similar if not exactly what um, your CGRs are, or your CATIA graphic representations. And what that is, is just lightweight representations that don't have any design data in it. It's really just the outer shell of your data. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to just kind of search through it and open your relevant parts. So you can open up a part as well as the surrounding data without having to kind of search through your PLM and open up random parts that you're not sure are going to be you know relevant uh, and what it does here is as you expand down through your tree it actually separates out all of your sub assemblies into um, onto a plate or what's called a turntable so in each turntable you can go and look at each specific part and decide from there what you want to open and what's relevant in that sub assembly so it really helps you hone in on specific data and right from here let's say we wanted to open up this brake pad you choose to open it right from here and right from this menu or interface rather it allows us to open it up right in our dense and rich environment that has all of our design data within it from here we can go and design and you could also go and open this, the parent assembly We'll see here, it opens up right in context. So as I mentioned, you can open up singular data, sub, sub assemblies, or the entire assembly. This assembly is, uh, you can work with it pretty easily. It's uh, pretty lightweight as far as data goes. Uh, Katia, its internal modeler is, uh, it excels at working with large data sets as it is. So we can open this up pretty pretty easily. And as we can see here, we have all of our rich data loaded up and ready to go. So we can go and design in context if we want, or we can do, decide to open our data in its own app and work from there. And we'll see both of those kind of scenarios. But first, looking at assembly design, we have this, uh, we have this clutch assembly here. And how I built this was just mirroring it or symmetrizing it using our break assembly and some extra commands that Katia provides. So I'll go and hide this and kind of redo the scenario. So going into our symmetry command, we can choose our data that we want to symmetrize. And if I click a piece of data and then hold down the shift key, we get this set of lines that lets us choose our level or what set us, uh, what sub-assembly or assembly we want to open so or just use rather or activate so i'll go and select this level here that includes the brake and the mirror and the reservoir 
and then I'll choose my symmetry plane. We see in real time, our preview gets built. And what's more is obviously there's some data that we don't want to symmetrize. So in a clutch, we don't need a break reservoir, right? So we can go in and once again, using the level selector, we have some options in our context menu, which if you're familiar with SOLIDWORKS, uh, it's basically just a menu that pops up based on which data you're selecting uh, and in what context of the app you're in. So it brings up relevant commands that you're most likely gonna use in this scenario. So here we have the option to go and say, no symmetry on the reservoir. And then say this pin, we don't really need to create a new symmetric part for this. We can use the same one. So we can choose same reference and we see our color coding on our legend over here, it matches up. So going through and changing a few more of our parts, we add the same reference on these bolts. These are standard parts, cap screws rather. And then this clamp is also a standard part or rather we don't need to symmetrize, we're gonna use same reference. And here we see it shift a little bit. That's just because it's using, you know, the symmetrize axis. So by using our context menu again, we can choose our reference plane to position that correctly. So once again, um, we don't need a brake master cylinder over here. We need a clutch master cylinder. So we also, on top of excluding or using the same reference, we can choose to replace it with a, an existing reference that's already in our database. So by hitting existing reference, we see this little filter icon come up. And what that means is that now we have the ability to go through our search or to any other open part in session and choose it right from there to be applied. So you see, once I click clutch master cylinder, we see it in our existing reference legend, color matches up, the geometry matches up. And now clicking into 3D space, this is gonna commit the data. So here we see it's generating, it's thinking a little bit. We'll give it that time. And keep in mind, um, say you accidentally clicked in the 3D space and committed the command. At any point, you can go and find the symmetry command at the level of the assembly. So here we have the symmetry at the wing mirror level. And then here we have a symmetry at, you know, the root level of this assembly. Double clicking on that will bring that legend back up and allow us to work on that data again and to modify that, sym that symmetry. I'm not gonna bring it up now just because it takes a second to load. So going off that, we're gonna move on to the next step here. So as I mentioned earlier, we have the option to design in context. So if I went to this brake caliper, I could go in, hide some surrounding data and go in, double click one of my holes here. This was created with a pattern. So here, and it was created a pattern from this hole right here. So I can write in real time and in my assembly, I can go and modify that geometry there, right there. And as we can see, it doesn't line up. I did that on purpose. And just uh, undoing some steps here and then putting it back into place. So not only can we design in context, but obviously we can go and design in a different tab. I'm gonna go to the part, say right click, go to the name of my part, and then say open a new app. And now my data is open in its own app. So this has already been built up, but we're gonna go and start from scratch on this. I'm gonna just go and hide this data. Then I'm gonna go and insert a new part body. Of course, first switching over to our part design. So in our compass over here, we can access all of our apps. And activating part design up here, we can see it's activated. And I just need to go and find my wireframes. So over here, we have our hide show view. So by clicking on this little triangle over here, Everything that's in our hidden view 
we can now take a look at and choose to go and show them again. So we just want to access all these sketches here. Say hide show. Let's see. Now we have those sketches ready to go for us. So we do have uh, our typical option. Let me go in and add a part body real quick. And we'll work in this body right here. And so we do have the option to design our typical way by going and choosing our pad, choosing the wireframe we want to uh, extrude it by, and then choosing our length here. But also, the 3D experience, we're given the option to use our robot to expedite design. So once again, with our robot and our context commands, it knows you know we're in part design, we're choosing a wireframe, a closed wireframe especially, and by dragging it, it knows that you know we want to create a pad. And what's more is as I line them up with these planes here, we could see I'm lined up with this plane as it calls out plane 24. So it automatically knows as I'm dragging this that it wants up to plane condition. So if I go in there, it says, you know, up to plane. And as I double click on it, even though these commands are quick and expedited, by double clicking on it, you know, we always have access to our rich commands. Now I'm just going to go and change this to dimension negative 22.5. Oops, that was meters. Units are important. We want millimeters. There we go. Perfect. So once again, I'm going to use my robot. I'm going to extrude out this pad similarly. And this one is actually going to want to be up to that plane. So we'll set that up to plane 23. And then moving our robot off into just 3D space goes and resets it. And another thing to note is that this is always following your orientation. So if you ever know want to know what kind of plane you're near or what is the closest base plane, we can see right here that we're looking at something that's close to our ZY plane. So knowing this is a cast part, we're going to go into our refine tab, add some draft angles. So we could choose our draft face and our neutral element. And then choosing preview, we could see what we're doing to the part with our draft, whether we're adding or removing material. Right now, our uh, our volume is pretty set, so we want to keep. We don't want to add any material at this point. We want to try to keep weight reduced. So once again, using the back face, choosing our neutral element and our pulling direction. We're once again cutting away material. And we could also use some uh, some boolean commands here. So just grab this body from the old one, and paste it in there for reuse. Just unhide this. So we want to add this body to our body here, right? Let me go make this a little easier for us right now. Hide those wireframes. So, going into our structure toolbar, we go into union trim. And then by choosing, we choose the body that we want to trim. Body to trim is body to trim. And then we choose faces to remove. So, it knows by just choosing a singular face. It kind of knows how to propagate that through and decide what we want to keep or remove. So we'll leave that as is. And then looking again at our uh, at our context commands, we can go and choose an edge and add a fillet to that and modify that fillet on the fly by dragging this icon. And if we pull it out far enough to where it fails, it'll tell us it fails by right? this little red X. And we could also choose right in 3D, how to edit those and what uh, choose what radius we want. And of course, we have the option to use our rich commands as well, and it works exactly the same.
So next we want to cut away some of these back faces here. I'm going to show this wireframe again real quick. And we're actually going to use this orange and green profile to cut away. And we're actually going to use the same exact method that we used to create the pads earlier by just using our robot. Now, the only difference here is the context in which we're using this. In this context, we're intersecting the part. So when I drag this, instead of creating a pad, it's going to cut away. Repeating that step, get this cut here. And then reset our robot. And I'm just going to go quick and add some extra drafts for it to account for these faces that we just created back here. This side of the way. And choosing our neutral element, we can activate a preview. And I still want to keep cutting away so that preview makes sense. And we'll commit the command. So now we'll want to go and create some holes in the back of this part to accept the, the push pins for the brake pads. What we're going to do, uh, let's take a look at our wireframe again. We're going to use this plane right here and using our context menu again, we can go and choose a sketch or we can go into model and do it. But we're going to do it from our context menu. We'll be able to say we're going to kind of recreate these actual holes right here, but let's go and hide them just so we don't, just so we're not confused. And we're going to just going to go and put some, put some circles in here. Then we're going to use just context commands and uh, also constraints to center these or to, uh, to correctly position them. So I made a constraint between the edge of this circle and the edge of the circle on the 3D data. So at any point, we can go and reference our 3D from a sketch. And before I commit that, I can just say right click. And I have my geometric or my geometric constraints here as well. So I can choose co concentricity. And then I can go and just choose constraint from my context menu, set the diameter, and then repeat the process for my other hole. Centric, and this one's gonna be a diameter of 30. And once again, exiting the command and using our robot tool, once again, recognizes that yes, we are intersecting. So we're gonna create a cut. So now it's time to take care of the rest of the sharp edges in this part. Um, we can assume this is going to be a cast part. So we want to get rid of those sharp edges as well as, you know, the drafts that we already did. Um, considering those as well as, you know, so we don't get any short shot conditions or any, you know, undesirable manufacturing conditions. So like I said, we can go in and, you know, we can do this fillet command on every sharp edge, but sometimes that's not ideal. Um, in a, in a great scenario where you have all the same radius that you want to account for on the entirety of a part, you can use auto fill it. What this allows you to do is to choose the faces in which you don't want to fill it applied or your functional faces. And then everywhere else, it's going to find a sharp edge and apply that radius, that fill it radius to it. So this is just our preview to make sure the command's going to commit before we try and, you know, run that computation. And now we see our fillets have been applied. So next we're going to go in and add some holes. I'm actually going to find these axes and make sure to keep them. All right. Let's keep those axes and just hide these for now. Make it a little easier on everybody. So now we'll go in and add a hole using our hole command. And by selecting our axis and the face we want to apply the hole to, we get our hole command propagated. We'll go in, make this a diameter of six, say okay. And then um, we'll go in and propagate the rest of these holes. Now, 
I'll show here that we don't have to go and click the command and propagate each hole one by one. If we go and double click on any or most commands, that'll force the command to persist. So now when I just click our axis and our face and commit the hole, it's now ready to automatically go and create another hole without having to go back down to the command. And as we can even see down at the command, it's still highlighted. Going and putting in the rest of these holes. Oops. Making sure to select the right order. And we're going to add this one as a diameter of 12. And now let's imagine that some of these holes need to accept an M6 cap screw. And what we can do is we can go directly into the command, change the type to counter bore, and then we have access in any of these holes, any of these hole types, we have access to our standard types. We can go choose metric and our M6. Say preview. Now that counter bore is applied. We want to apply it to some other holes though. So we'll use a nice little tool that you might kind of recognize or be similar to Microsoft tools, which is the semantic painter. So we can take the quote unquote format, if you will, of a geometric body and apply it to other relevant bodies. So choosing our counter bore or basically the M6 condition, M6 counter bore condition, we can choose a semantic painter. And we'll see it highlights all of the relevant data that can accept this new condition. And simply by clicking each item, it automatically applies and converts that hole over. I'm committing the 3D space. We can also pattern. So by choosing a geometry and then choosing an axis, and holding down the control key, we can get, we can instantiate a pattern. We can also go up to our account and edit the number of instantiations we want. We're just gonna leave it at two and kind of just place it on 19 for now. So finally, now that we've quote unquote built our part, we wanna check it for manufacturability. And within CATIA, you do have some white simulation options that don't require you to go into a full simulation program. Uh, this is just kind of preliminary simulations or preliminary checks to make sure that the part can be manufacturable and you don't come back with a no-build quote. So going into view, any, with any simulation, uh, we need to put our data into material view. I kind of see it as it says it's loading materials. It brings in kind of this, uh, it brings in that relevant information. So material data, density, um, you know, and from there you can get your weight calculations, uh, modulus, et cetera. Uh, so uh, with this, even though uh, we're only checking manufacturability for draft direction and thickness, um, it still loads in those materials. We'll give it just a sec. It's loading in, you know, all the materials for everything we created in this assembly. So it's it's going to take a, a quick second. And here we go. So going into our review tab, go into draft analysis, and we choose the data we want to analyze. And uh, here we have our graph, which is on my other screen. Uh oh, just a moment. There we go. So here it's going to check the draft angle against you know this kind of this kind of format here. So you can choose you can choose to show more data, different colors. You can even go and adjust the actual angle you want to check against. We're just going to leave it at two degrees. Let's see, we can go and add you know more more options there. And by choosing a robot option, we can use the robot to define our die direction. And now we can see, you know, based off this graph here, what is going to accept the die condition and what's going to get trapped in our die. So let me change it back to one that makes a little bit more sense. So anything in red, we're going to see is going to have like a trap condition or an undercut condition. 
So with some of these, we could see, you know, the drafts need to be, uh, the draft angles need to be increased here. We got some some issues on these holes here, but you know, with the holes, that's uh, that's post processing. That's most likely going to be drilled after it's casted. So those are fine, but we would want to go and adjust these draft angles here. We could also look at our thickness wall thickness analysis. And we could choose how many uh, are we could choose our scale and get uh, how precise we want to get on it. And by choosing a selection. And choosing run, it gives us this wall thickness analysis. So we can look at local thin areas. We can also cut a section. Kind of hone in on a specific area, make a note and, you know, even save it off for future reference or for if you're tossing it to somebody else so they can view it. I'm just going to hit cancel. So going back to not our explore window, but our design window, we could see you know, the gray part we just created has been developed in real time in our assembly view. And once again, you know, if I wanted to adjust that hole and make it actually line up at this point, I could double click and adjust that pattern like we saw earlier and just move it down. So now we're going to take a look at working on surface design. And we're going to do that by building this front fender we see right here. Similar to how we built the caliper. We're just going to take this full body and start from scratch on it. So once again, opening in a new app. Change our view back to shading with edges. And I'm going to just display the wireframes. while hiding our surfaces. I'm going to switch over to our generative shape design workbench. And once again, we could see that, you know, if I wanted to do, I wanted to build a revolve, I could take my wireframe, choose my axis and build a revolve this way. Once again, I can also take the robot, put it on my wireframe, then drop it onto my axis, and making sure we have the correct options chosen, go and build that revolve. And I'm going to build the rest of this fender in a similar manner. So taking this wireframe, dragging to do an extrude, holding down the control key, and dragging will do will instantiate a mirror. So it'll go the same, it'll go the same distance in both directions. We can also do a trim command and our split commands using context menus. So just to just how you normally pick your trim and splits, uh, doing multi-select, holding down your control key, you select the faces you want to keep in your trim or you know what sides of the intersection. And then you choose trim and commit it by clicking in 3D space. Now we're going to go and add a variable fill to this trim. And we're going to start. Um, I'm going to go and add some points on this trim intersection, and I could do that by uh, a good stable method to do that is going into the trim command and choosing intersection computation, and that'll actually build the line for you directly from the command. So now I can go and place some points on there. So I could put. I'm going to put one at zero, a ratio of zero. Put one halfway down, and then one at the opposite extremity. There we go. And now hiding our wireframe so we can pick the actual edge. We're going to go. We're going to go into our refine tab. Go find edge fill it and select the edge. And so this is just a continuous fill it, but we can change it right from our menu or right from our command window into a variable fill it. And you see it already placed some kind of points for us here. However, these are just points made in the command. It's, uh, you know, they'll work, but they're not, not the most stable. If you need to move around these, um, 
these variable fillet points to make a geometry work. Um, that's not the best method. Um, it's better to have these control points because you can move them in real time and see, you know, how your geometry is affected. Whereas the ones that are created in this command, um, to move them, you have to select them to make them go and that'll make them delete. And then you have to just reselect a random kind of area to make it, um, to make it work, which, you know, not the best method. This method, much nicer. So next, we're going to go and extrude a surface so we can clear our fork. And then once again, using our trim command, we'll trim those items together. We're going to go and place a fillet on here. And I'm actually just going to use the fillet option in here. And choose a 10 mil portal fillet. And let that instantiate. And then we're going to see some more of our split commands. We're going to build up the trim geometry. Oops. There we go. So once again, uh, with the split, you want to choose what you're splitting and then multi select next what you want to split it with. Then choose our split command and our geometry is created. Repeating that process for this wireframe here. So once again, what we want to split, what we want to split it with, and then choose the split. Now we got one half of our geometry. And we can go now and choose our transform because we want to get a symmetrized part of this. We just say symmetry and choose our YZ plane, as we can see from down here at our robot indicator or our compass. And we get a preview, say OK. Then I'm just going to go and get rid of this robot. And I'm just going to multi select both of these geometries. And in doing so, I get the option to join, which is just going to take both of these and place them into a single geometry. So We're running a little bit short on time, so I'm gonna just gonna show real quick our uh, our kind of assembly options. So we got this front wheel here. I'm gonna just gonna show real quick how to insert this and also create a mechanism with it. So I'm gonna go up to the top, the root of the assembly. That's the level I wanna insert it in. And just activating that, We'll make it so we're working within the context of this specific assembly. And I'm going to go down and say insert. We're going to say insert existing product. And once again, we get that little filter icon. That means that I can go and search. I'm going to search kind of just the same exact rim that we already made, but choosing it again puts it directly into our 3D, into our assembly. And we'll see what's more is that and it's hard to see it right now, but our robot is actually attached to the part by default because it knows that once you bring in an assembly part, it's more than likely not in the correct position. You want to move it so you can constrain it effectively. So it kind of does that step for you. And now in order to constrain this, we're going to use what's called engineering connections. So uh, engineering connections are the same uh, is the same concept that you're used to with just constraining, except with engineering connections, they also um, they also take in, take into consideration specific types of connections and degrees of freedom and uh, types of movements based off of those degrees of freedom. And what that allows you to do is it sets you up um, it sets you up so you can create a mechanism. and create like a kind of a kin kinematic assembly. 
So lining these up, we got a, a current value, upper value, lower value. And because we're doing axis to axis, um, here it's taking on, an, um, it's taking on an angular value. So we can set our upper and lower limits, those angular values. So we'll say zero, 900 degrees. And we'll just say, okay. And here it's just asking if, uh, so these are, you know, they're touching by, by nature. Uh, and here it just clarifies, you know, asks you if you want that to be, you know, if you want that to be checked later on, or if it's okay that they're, they're quote unquote clashing. So now that we've built these together, we create our engineering connections. We can go into our mechanism. And mechanism is just created similar to how we create all this data. You go and insert it and you create a new one, et cetera. It's not there by default. Uh, it's something you just place in there, but going into joints, this is how we dictate how this is going, how the kinematics are gonna work. So here's the revolute that we just created between our wheel and our axle. And then here's that angle that I put the zero and 900 on. So we have our list of um, engineering connections or constraints that we're considering what it's being driven by. And then update says, it just kind of tells us what our degrees of freedoms are and what commands are available to us. Clicking okay, we can now go into our command and we get a slider that allows us to go between our limits. And we see the wheel rotating for us. And then also, you know, as we get to our limit or, you know, if we hit something, uh, we get some messages here, warning messages. And um, say you were doing, uh, here it just reached the end of the 900 degrees, but say you were doing like a, a handshake operation in, uh, in a manufacturing plant or an assembly floor. Um, and, you know, in that handshake operation, there was a clash. You know, this running through this command and using these messages here, you can find that clash. And then finally, to sum it up, just looking at our save with options menu. So you've got your typical save where it's just gonna, you know, committed to the database, but you could choose to, before you save, you know, get an overview of exactly what's going on in your data before you commit it. So we get a color coding as well as an information window that tells us everything that's going on. So we have the status, whether it's not modified, new, modified, Excluded, which is done by us, which will be done in here. So you can say you want to exclude the data, it matches. And we could also, um, you know, look at if it's an assembly, see what's inside that assembly and what's getting modified inside of there. And once again, choose our options to exclude or not exclude, as well as our just our regular lifecycle operations. So right within our save with options, we can choose to change the maturity, revise, duplicate create a branch or what have you.